at 9 a.m. for Bible study and 10 a.m. for worship, and then Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Come visit with us. We hope to see you there. And as the church continues to grow, people are driving miles to hear the truth. Yes, I drove an hour to get here, but it's worth it, and we try to do it every week. I think we've definitely developed a reputation here. I think folks know who we are. Uh, they're familiar with what we teach. Um, <clears throat> I think there's still a lot of territory to be covered. I think things are going wonderful. Right. And I really think that Johnny is one of the best preachers I ever heard in my life, and he's got two sons that are going to follow in his steps. So I wouldn't want to be anywhere but here. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. Don't flex your muscles. Flex your mind. Watch a word from the Lord. Thursday nights at 9. I did for science. I despise, hate, detest, and loathe the Church of Christ and everything about it. I, I hate them. I really do. The better I get to know them, the more I hate them. I, I want to rid the world of the churches of Christ. See why the atheists don't like the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services are 11 a.m. and Wednesday at 7 p.m. at 823 Starling Avenue. Watch them on TV in Martinsville at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and on Sunday on WGSR. Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting babble? Are you tired of this commercial? So am I. Well, these commercials may be old and boring, but the gospel we preach never is. Come study the Bible with the Church of Christ. We're meeting at 250 the Boulevard. Our new times are Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study and 10 a.m. for worship, and then Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Come visit with us. We hope to see you there. I despise, hate, detest, and loathe the Church of Christ and everything about it. I, I hate them. I really do. The better I get to know them, the more I hate them. I, I want to rid the world of the churches of Christ. See why the atheists don't like the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services are 11 a.m. and Wednesday at 7 p.m. at 823 Starling Avenue. Watch them on TV in Martinsville at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and on Sunday on WGSR. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. Jim's over here with you. We're glad you are, are with us tonight. <clears throat> we are going to, uh, and I'm, we're going to uh, be giving you a lesson about uh, how do you know which church is actually the true church. And I didn't realize my, my player is so big here. Uh, our content information, if I can get this down in front of us here. Well, I hate that is uh, we meet at 250 the Boulevard <clears throat> there in Eden, North Carolina. You're welcome to come by and visit with us. Uh, you can reach me at 276-340-2653. Uh, and we hope that you will do that very thing. We, we assemble on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock for Bible study and, and Sundays on the first day of the week uh, at, at 9 o'clock for Bible study and 10 o'clock <clears throat> for, for worship. And we hope that you will come by and visit with us anytime you can. Wordmlord at gmail.com is how you can reach us. And if you're in the Martinsville area, I know Mark's put this content information up, but some of you are just tuning in. Uh, 823 Starling Avenue is where you can meet with the brethren in Martinsville. 120 American Legion for the folks in Danville. And uh, we hope that you will do that very thing. Also, WHIGTV.com uh, uh, com is where you can watch uh, What Does the Bible Say on Tuesday nights at 9 p.m. coming out of Rocky Mount, North Carolina. And so for those of you who are watching online, uh, we hope that you will, will do that very thing. We have people calling from all over that are watching, that are, uh, that are tuned in on Facebook. And so we hope that you will certainly uh, uh, tune in to these uh, other broadcasts of, uh, of the Bible that is being taught. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to hearing from you. And we appreciate the fact that you are watching and you're uh, trying to pay attention to what, what is going on. Now, friends, one thing that... that uh, like I said, we want to bring up before you, bring to your attention, is 
the, the idea that the church of Christ is the only church that you read about in the Bible. A lot of people don't like to hear us when we say that, but I want you to realize that there is a way to find out if in fact the church of Christ that we are preaching, that we're teaching, if in fact it is the church you read about in the Bible. Now, how are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? Well, when you talk about, when you say the church of Christ, you talk about the one kind of church in the Bible, people will always say, well, you know, there's, a, there's many churches, there's even many people, there's many uh, different uh, sects or different groups of people that will refer to themselves as the church of Christ. The United Church of Christ is one of them. And people have called in even on this program and said, well, you know, y'all must, y'all, y'all headquarters is, is in Texas or somewhere else. No, that must be some uh, man-made organization you're talking about. The Church of Christ that you read about in the Bible and the Church of Christ of which I'm a member of does not have an earthly headquarters. And you can know that it is not part of any uh, particular group that you may find in the yellow pages or whatever by simply going to the Bible and finding out what that church looked like in the Bible and you will see that we're practicing the same things. Now, but individuals get upset when they say this. For example, here is a, a, a booklet that Mr. Ernest Hopkins uh, wrote and passed out and I, we, we covered this uh, a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago. And this is some of the things that he said. This is the first paragraph and I want to cue in on this. And listen again to what he says, and we're going to use that kind of a springboard, because he is not the only one that's ever said this. But listen to what he says. This is from Mr. Ernest Hopkins from Stuart, Virginia. And this is what he says. He says, uh, denominational church is not in the Bible. He says, this is a statement made often by the Campbellites. Now listen to what he's saying. The Campbellites, who use this to convince their members that their group is the only church in the Bible. Then he says, the Campbellite churches of Christ today cannot trace their origin back to the first century. The doctrine and practice of these churches started by Alexander Campbell in the 18th century. Uh, These churches are not like the first churches of Christ that are in the Bible, but they have convinced their members that they are. Well, I wonder how how we did that. How we convinced the, the, the members of the church of Christ that they are identical to the church you read out in the Bible. Well, Mr. Hopkins, we've just gone back and we've demonstrated that they're identical. Something that you you can't do. But then he says, none of the church of Christ in America today are mentioned in the Bible. Well, friends, that's because the churches of Christ in America had not not, uh, been established in the Bible, Bible times. But you can find churches of Christ in the Bible And they can be identical to the churches of Christ that are established today. But now Mr. Hopkins is not not the only one that has made this claim that the church of Christ has started in the uh, 18th century by Alexander Campbell. Listen to what this man says. Now this is going to be uh, a gentleman that we have uh, used before. We have talked about uh, some of the things that he's taught before. This is Mr. J.C. Richardson. Now Mr. J.C. Richardson... He's in the apostolic church. He's in the apostolic church. And this is what he says about the church of Christ. We're going to play this uh, little tidbit about the the, the church and, and show his misunderstanding about where the church began. Now, um, we're still doing research uh, 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 on the Church of Christ, and there are many of you who have questions about that simply because uh, of the programs that they have gotten on. Now, I... I, 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 I,
Mr. Uh, Richardson says, and then what Mr. Hopkins says, both are saying that the Church of Christ that we preach started in the 18th century. Now, let's just see then what the Bible is going to have to say. We need to clarify how the church started and when it came into existence and how it then exists today. That's what we're going to do. Let's start with a principle that everybody should recognize. Even, even the scientific-minded of our community should recognize this, that, that there is a law, a law of nature, the law of reproduction, that is you reap what you sow, or that is like begets like. Now, in Galatians 6 and verse 7 and 8, the Apostle Paul said that be not deceived, whatever, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now, we understand that principle. We understand that when you go out to your garden and you sow corn seed in your garden, you're going to get corn. You're not going to get watermelons. You're not going to get cantaloupe. You're not going to get peas. You're not going to get tomatoes. You're going to get corn. Because like begets like. There is a natural law that says like begets like, produced after its own kind. Genesis 1 and verse 11, when God created the world, and he created all the living things, whether it was trees, whether it was plants, or whether it was animals, they all reproduced after their kind. And so what, you've, what you realize is there's two things there that, that are unchangeable. Those are two laws. Whatever you reap, you're going to sow, because whatever you sow is going to produce after its kind. If you plant a, an apple tree, have a, here, here we have an apple tree. If you plant an apple seed, it's going to produce an apple tree that is then in turn going to produce apples. It's not going to produce peaches or pears or plums. You see, that's just the way it is. It is if you plant a pear, vice versa, uh, by the same token, if you plant a pear tree, it's not going to produce apples. Now, I know the evolutionists in our, in our community would have us believe that uh, over a period of time, long, 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 me and B and G and of years of time, you give enough time, that eventually something is going to change into a different kind. Now, <clears throat> Mr. Larry Serber gave, uh, gave me a book by Richard Dawkins, and he wanted me to read this chapter about, uh, and I believe it was chapter 5, or maybe it's 13, I can't remember, but it was the chapter he wanted us to read. And it was, had to do really with, with uh, I remember it had to do with dogs. And it was like all these different, different kinds of dogs. Well, you know what? A dog can be bred with another dog, and guess what it will always produce? It will always produce a dog. There may be different breeds of dogs. There may be different dogs that have different characteristics. They may be in different sizes and shapes. But you want know they're all dogs. They are all dogs. They are all reproduced after their own kind. Never have you had a dog breed a cat. See, you just don't get it because they're not of the same kind. Now, scientists don't even know what a kind really is. They can't explain what a kind is. They have genuses, species, and so forth, but they can't understand what a kind is because. It is, it is something that, that they're, uh, trying to, uh, they're, they're trying to explain away what the Bible is teaching. And so, but they just can't figure out how it is that you can have all these diverse animals, but yet they're all called dogs or all called cats or whatever. God has put a law in place that said everything produced after its own kind. Now, what is the seed? We're talking about the church. What is the seed then of the church? Listen, the seed that is sown to produce a Christian, and therefore the church, is called the Word of God. Notice this, in Luke chapter 8, and verse 11, Luke 8 and verse 11, <clears throat> you're going to have the principle that we just established put in place. Luke 8, verse 11, Jesus said, Now the seed of the kingdom is the Word of God. Luke 8 and verse 11. The, 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 the seed is the Word of God. When you, when you produce or when you plant the seed, it's always going to produce something after its kind. The seed is the Word of God. So when we are preaching the gospel, guess what we're doing? We're sowing the seed. We're, we're sowing the seed of the kingdom. And that then is what it's going to produce. It's going to produce one kind of plant. One thing is going to be produced when you sow the seed. Now, the seed has life in it. Listen. In John 6 and verse 63, John chapter 6 and verse 63, here's what Jesus says. He says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Now, just like the seed 
just like the seed that you plant in the ground, there is life in that seed. That corn seed has life in it. It has life in it. That's what makes it grow. That's what produces the plant. Now, if you don't believe that it matters what you plant, and if you don't believe that things reproduce after your own kind, well, then you go out and you plant a diamond. I tell you what, I'd like to plant some diamonds and grow diamonds, but you know what? You just don't do that. You don't put a diamond in the ground and say, well, you know what? I'm going to water it and fertilize it, and in a little bit of time, we'll have a diamond tree. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Plant a gold tree, a silver tree, and, and reproduce. It doesn't work that way, friends, because there has to be some life in the seed in order to produce the plant. Well, if the seed is the Word of God, if the seed is the Word of God, then if we plant the seed then the seed will then have the opportunity to germinate and grow and produce. It's not in the sower. It's not in the one that goes out and sows the seed. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Listen to what Paul is going to say. He says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in the craftiness of, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commanding, commending ourselves, uh, commending ourselves <clears throat> to, to uh, uh, every man's conscience in the sight of God. Now listen to what he says. He says, "In whom, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid from them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not." lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And so the gospel, the gospel is, is what's going to produce. The gospel is what has the power to change lives. The gospel has the power to produce something because it is the seed. It doesn't really have any uh, matter about the, the, the sower. You know, the most wicked man can, can give someone a Bible, and that Bible is what's going to produce the change. Romans 1, verse 16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the seed is what must be sown if you're going to make a change. Now, if the seed has to be sown, then that's where we come to play. Now, Mr. Hopkins is going to say, well, you can't, you can't sow the seed, you have to be called and so forth. And he makes this long uh, 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 labored argument about you have to be called or you have to be sent. You can't, you can't preach unless you've been sent. But friends, if the seed has been sown in the heart, it's going to produce and it's going to then in turn produce someone who is wants to share the seed or spread the seed further. That's the whole idea of spreading the gospel. And so the seed then has to be sown. In John 6, verses 44 and 45, listen to what Jesus says about the seed and how it operates. John 6, verse 44 and 45, he says, No man can come unto me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up in the last day. All right, well, how are we drawn? Notice it's always going to come back to the Word. The Word is going to have play a part in getting people back to God. It is written in the prophets, and they all shall be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard... And hath learned of the Father, cometh unto me. And so the people who hear the word, what are they doing? They are producing. They're having, uh, the, the word is actually producing something in their lives. Now, so what we have to realize then is we have to realize that the seed has to be kept in order to reproduce something. If you're going to plant a crop, Friends, if you want to plant a crop and you don't want to buy seed every year, you know what you have to do? You have to keep some seed back. You have to keep some seed back in order to plant it the next year. All right? So that's really what we're talking about. Once the seed has been produced, then if it produces more and more, if it produces fruit, then that seed is always going to be there. Now notice this. In Galatians 1, Galatians 1 verse 11 and 12, here is what, here is what Paul is going to say about the seed. Galatians 1, verse 11 and 12, he said, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which is preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, 
but uh, by the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know what the seed is today? The seed is the Word of God, and it has been revealed by Jesus Christ unto his inspired writers, and they then wrote it down, and now the seed is in written form. The seed is the Word, but the seed now is in written form. It is the Word of God, and it is what is going to make changes. How do we know this? It's because We know this because the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, Notice, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3. The writer says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord? What was spoken by the Lord? The words of salvation. Salvation comes through hearing the gospel, Romans 1, 16. So the gospel, the gospel of salvation was, was preached it was spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. So the gospel was confirmed. It was confirmed. It was verified. How was it verified? In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 4, Paul said, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So when the New Testament writers were receiving the Word of God, the seed of the Word of God, the seed of the kingdom. They were writing it down and they were demonstrating and verifying that indeed it was the Word of God and they were doing so by the miracles by which they did. So we have the seed now that now is in written form. And friends, that is why we say the church has always been existent because it could exist in the, in the seed form. The church that this seed produces will never be extinct. It will never be extinct because the seed always has the ability to produce a Christian and therefore Christians and therefore the members of the church that Christ established. It's always been in seed form. That's why the devil doesn't want the seed to be sown. Notice in Luke chapter 8 verse 11, now this is where we started, Luke chapter 8 and verse 11. Luke chapter 8 and verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Now friends, why does the devil not want the word to be preached? Because it has the ability to change lives. It has the ability to produce fruit. It has the ability to grow, so the devil wants to take the word out because the word is the seed. And, you know, friends, if, if you've done any gardening at all, you know that if you plant some seed in the garden and the birds come and, and, uh, and uh, uh, eat the seed, you're not going to have a garden because the seed is gone. The seed has been taken away. There's nothing going to be produced. There's nothing going to be produced because there is no seed in the ground. If there is no seed in the heart, it's not going to produce a Christian. It's not going to produce a child of God. It's not going to produce a member of the church of Christ. Now, here's the problem that we have with guys like Mr. Hopkins and guys like Mr. J.C. Richardson. What they do is they don't understand how the seed works. They still don't understand it because they're too busy focusing on a chain of events that, have got, have, that can trace a group of Christians all the way back to the first century, and they think, well, since we can't do that, then the church of Christ must not have been in existence all this time. Well, if you don't realize how the seed produces, then you'll never understand how you can say the church is the same today as it was in the first century. Look what Mr. Richardson says. Listen to what he says. He says, Essentially, the church of Christ teaches a position of religious superiority. They purport to be the only true New Testament church today. And the unfortunate and even sad part about all this is that there is absolutely no history of this group's existence before 1800 A.D. So since the church of Jesus, since the church of Jesus started 30 A.D., are we to believe that our Lord and our Lord never had a genuine, authentic witness for 1,770 years? You can see how absurd and foolish such thinking really is. 
No, I see how foolish and absurd, uh, absurd the reasoning ability of Mr. J.C. Richardson is. Yes, the Lord's church started in A.D. 30 or A.D. 33, the first century. Yes, it started in the first century. But since the seed of the kingdom is the word of God, Mr. Richardson, do you think that we, have, we don't have, hadn't had the word of God for 1,700 years? Is that what you're saying? Do you believe that the word of God has not been in existence for 1,700 years? Because if, if it has, then there has been a witness, if you will, of the church that Jesus established. It's right here in the seed. It's right here in the seed. So Mitchell Richardson doesn't understand how a seed works. Maybe he needs to go to horticulture class. Maybe he needs to take a garden, a gardening class, or maybe he needs to go down to the, to the local uh, uh, gardening club and join the gardening club, and maybe they can teach him how a seed works. Because the seed of the kingdom is the word of God, and when it's planted, it will germinate. Now listen, listen. A seed may lie dormant. It may lie dormant for a long time. It may not germinate. But that does not mean that the seed does not have the power of life in it. Listen, I remember growing up, and we had a garden every year, and we kept seed. We kept seed from the plants. We kept uh, seed okra. We kept uh, uh, peas. We'd let them dry out on the vine. We'd shell, up, shell the dry ones out. We'd save them, and we'd plant them in the garden next year. Guess what? They'd grow. But you know what? If we didn't plant them that next year, the year after that, guess what we could do? We could plant them, and they would still produce. Now think about this, friends. Don't you think, don't you think that God intended for us to realize the power of a seed and the fact that it could lie dormant and still produce year after year? And so uh, uh, think about this. When the children of Israel were were to keep the Sabbath year and they would let the ground lie fallow, how were they supposed to eat? Well, guess what? When, where did they get the, the seed to plant their crops the next year when they plowed the ground? Well, it's seed that they had preserved and kept for a whole year. And then when the Jubilee year came around, guess what? That, that uh, lay, lay fallow on the, the Sabbath year they had to let it lie fallow on the year of the Jubilee. And then they still, so then they had to wait two years before they could ever plant and produce a crop. But yet the power of life is in the seed. And so those crops would grow. Even though the seed was dormant, that didn't change the power of the seed. It didn't change the fact that life was still in the seed. Listen to this. this listen to this. Uh, under the care of UCLA plant physiologist uh, Jane Sheen Miller, an ancient sacred lotus seed germinated after lying dormant for over a thousand years. The seed was discovered in the 1920s in a deposit of sacred lotus fruits in a dry lake bed at uh, Palatian, China. It is quote, the oldest demonstrably viable and directly dated seed ever reported, according to the report, report in the American Journal of Botany. A thousand-year-old seed germinated. Now, friends, let me ask you this. If the seed is the Word of God, if the seed is the Word of God, and the seed is laying on a shelf somewhere, in some dark room, forgotten, and let's just say for... A thousand years, no one has ever picked up the Bible. No one has ever read it. And therefore, there, let's say there is no members of the church of Christ like in the New Testament for all these thousands of years. If someone picks this book up and the seed, which is the seed of the kingdom, is planted into the heart of man, do you mean to tell me that it is not going to produce the same kind of Christian that was produced a thousand years prior? See, friends, the power is in the seed. The power is in the word. And so what you need to realize is that the word of God may lie dormant. But that doesn't mean that 
the church ceased to exist. It just existed in a, in a seed form. If, if you couldn't trace back a congregation of the Lord's people, if you could not find a church of Christ throughout history all the way back to the first century, that does not change the fact that the seed that produced that church in the first century, it doesn't change the fact that that seed that produced the church in the first century could still produce that same church a thousand or two thousand years later if the seed is indeed the word of God. See, what Mr. Richardson and Mr. Hopkins don't realize is they don't realize how seed works. And they don't realize the power of God's word in seed form. So what you need to, in this time to think about, friends, is just because you may not be able to find something in history that shows the church, and I believe, I believe that you can, you can trace, uh, uh, you can trace churches of Christ back way further than, than Alexander Campbell or Thomas Campbell, his father even. But friends, for the sake of what we're dealing with tonight, just consider the fact that if the seed germinates, it's only going to produce after it's kind. Now, let me give you another example of how the seed can lie dormant. The dormant seed is the Word of God. Now look at the Word of God, how it could be forgotten and still produce change many years later. In 1 King, 2 Kings chapter 22, 2 Kings 22 and verse 8, 2 Kings 22 and verse 8, And Hilkiah the high priest said unto uh, Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law of the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. Now what did, what did Shaphan do? And Shaphan the scribe, verse 9, came to the king and brought to him, uh, brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered together and uh, found, uh, they've gathered the money, whatever, and we've also found the book. Lost my place here. Found the book in the house and have delivered it into the hand of, of them that do the work. I'm sorry, let me give here to verse 10. And Shaphan the scribe, and Shaphan the scribe uh, showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book, and Shaphan read it before the king. And you know what? What happened when they read the book of the law of God that was lost for all these years? You know what they did? They started making changes. They started making reform, reformations. They started making changes to get back to doing what God had said. Friends, do you know what, do you know what it's called? The period of history is called when men like Thomas Campbell and Alexander Campbell started getting back to the Bible, when they started saying things like, we will speak where the Bible speaks and we'll be silent where the Bible's silent. Do you know what that period of history is called when, uh, when, when people start uh, saying, when they said, no creed but the Bible? You know what it's called? It's called the Restoration called the Restoration. And prior to that, when men like, when men like uh, Martin Luther and, and uh, John Wycliffe and some of these guys were getting back and they realized, you know what, we need to get, find the Word of God and, and deliver it to the hands of people. You know what it's called? It's called the Reformation. They're reforming and restoring. That's exactly what happens when you find the Bible. It causes reformation. It causes restoration because it causes people to get back to the pattern of that God has always wanted. The seed can produce the same product, the same, the same fruit, even years later after it's been lying dormant. So if, 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 if that is the case with, the, with a regular seed, why wouldn't it be the case with the Word of God? But remember what our critics say. Remember what our critics say. They say, essentially the Church of Christ teaches a position of religious superiority. And he said, and... Uh, uh, there is absolutely no history of this group's existence before 1800 A.D. That's what Mr. Uh, 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 Richardson said. And then, if we go back and read what, uh, if we go back and read what uh, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Hopkins said, Mr. Hopkins said that the the Campbellite Church of Christ cannot trace 
their origin back to the first century. So they say we can't trace the origin of the church that you read about the Bible back to the first century, that there is no uh, proof that there is no history of the group's existence before 1800 AD. Well, is there, a, is there a proof of the existence of the Bible before that time? If you can prove that the Bible existed before that time, friends, then you have proven that the church that is produced when you read this Bible existed at that time. Are you going to tell me that you don't believe that that, that lotus tree, let's say that lotus tree that we just read about, you mean tell me that that lotus tree never existed? For a thousand years, that lotus tree just never, it never was in existence. Yeah, it was in existence. It was right there in that seed. And it's proven that it existed because when you planted the seed, guess what produced? The lotus tree. And so, if the Bible existed after the first century, then the church that, it, that is produced when you preach this word existed as well. Now, friends, that's, that's proof. That's proof that the church you read about in the Bible has always been in existence. All right, uh, Matt, we can have phone numbers up. Someone might have a question about the, uh, the existence of the church and how it is that we can say the church has always been in existence. But I want you to consider this, friends. The church has always been in existence because, because the seed has always been in existence. If the church producing seed is the word of God and any time that seed is planted, it's going to produce after its own kind, then do we really need to be able to trace a line of people back who believed and followed the word of God? Do we need to find that all the way back to Jerusalem? Do, do we really need to, 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 uh, to have that? See that? But yet, we have critics. We have critics like J.C. Richardson and, and uh, uh, Ernest Hopkins that want to deny the existence of the Church of Christ. And instead, they want to say, well... It can't be true because we can't find it. Well, friend, just because you can't find it doesn't mean it didn't exist. It just means you haven't looked hard enough or you haven't reasoned well enough or you haven't opened your eyes or your mind well enough. Listen again what Mr. J.C. Richardson says. He says there is no way that a 1906 church could be the only true church after the entire history of Christianity. It's simply not possible. It is possible, Mr. J.C. Richardson. It's possible because the church that you're talking about did not start in 1906. It didn't start in the 1800s. It started way prior to that. It started way prior to that. And, uh, and then Mr. Hopkins again says, well, you know, it didn't exist until the 18th century. There's no churches like that uh, uh, today. Or the churches that are, that are today are not part of the first century. Well, Mr. Hopkins, Mr. Richardson, maybe you need to read your Bible again and realize what the Word of God is capable is capable of doing. Now, I find it very interesting. I find it very interesting that people want to say, they want to deny that the Church of Christ, that we're members of, that we preach, that the Bible talks about, they want to say, well, that's not the same. That Y'all are not part of the same kind of church as you were about in the first century. But do you know what then they turn around to do? Here's what they turn around to do. They go, the true church is the church we're in. Now, li now listen to this. Listen to it. Listen to what J.C. Richardson says. Uh, let's see here. This is J.C. Richardson, and he's going to tell us that the apostolic church is the only church. Because I really want you to hear that. All right, uh, I can track you from A.D. 33 to 2005, the apostolic church. 
I can give you a historical chronology, scripture and history. We didn't just pop up. When he quoted, the reason I don't want him to have a copy of my tape, because he quotes stuff out of context. He played a tape of mine when I talked about the contemporary black apostolic church, 1900 to the present. That's not the apostolic church in its entirety. I was just talking about the contemporary. He didn't say that. He also played another one of my tapes when I talked about the African-American religious experience. And I said I hadn't done my research on the Church of Christ. I got my research done now. All right? All right. So, uh, eight. D33, the Apostolic Pentecostal Church started. And until around 90 AD, that was the only church. Now, so in AD 33, the Apostolic Church started. Now, I believe, let me just see if I can quote Mr. Richardson here. Maybe I should go back and, and uh, uh, find the slide. So he says the Apostolic Church is the only true church. Now, let's just see here. Wasn't it, uh, wasn't it Mr. Richardson that said uh, something about uh, arrogant? No, I'm not, I'm not quoting it right. Let me get over here. Let me, find, let me find his quote. Let me find his quote. What did he say about that? He said, when we say, when we say that the church we're in is the only church, uh, the Church of Christ teach a position of religious superiority. So he says that when we say that we are members of the only kind of church you read about in the Bible, then we're being religiously superior. We're looking down at the news at everybody. And then he comes along and says, the apostolic church is the only church. Well, that's really religiously superior of you, Mr. Richardson. That's very condescending of you. That's very, that's very haughty of you to say that. That's very judgmental of you to say that. You see, friends, here's what you find. When people, when people uh, deny that what we're teaching is the church in the Bible, and that we're members of the church, you know what they then turn around and do? They turn around and they say, we are members, we are members of the, the true church. The church that we're members of is the real church. That's what, that's what uh, 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 really comes down to. Listen to this. Let's go back and let's listen to what Mr. Uh, uh, Hopkins is going to say. Now remember, he says that we are not members of the church you read about in the Bible. He says, we're, there, you know, there's not possible. It's no, no way. Now listen to what he says. He says, I'm going to try to enlarge this for you a little bit. He says, the primitive, and oh, you can't, it's hard to read that. He says, the primitive Baptist church of Christ, what they teach is in the Bible. These churches of Christ were called primitive Baptist by other denominations. Well, friends, if the primitive Baptist doctrine was in the Bible, then you would find that church mentioned in the Bible. And if, by the way, Mr. Hopkins, if primitive Baptist is such a derogatory name that was given to the true church of Christ, why do you still call yourself primitive Baptist? Why don't you then just go back and say, well, I'm a member of the church of Christ. Why don't you say that? Why don't you just drop Primitive Baptist? You see, friends, what happens is when you start showing that the church you read about in the Bible that's produced by this seed, when you start showing that it is identical to the church that you're in, when you start showing people that what we're doing is identical to what they did in the first century, what they taught, what they practiced, when you show that from the Bible, everybody gets upset and they say, well, you're religiously superior. Your religious spirit, your doctrine is not in the Bible, but you know what? The doctrine I'm in is in the Bible. The church I'm in is in the Bible. But friends, here's the problem. Here's the problem with that. When I say the church that I'm in is in this book, I can find it. I can find it by name. I can find it by doctrine. I can find it by practice. I can, I can find it. But when I start examining the primitive Baptist church, and I start listening to their doctrine, born in sin, 
born in sin, uh, can't fall from grace, right? When, when I start hearing them talk about, well, you know, pre-election, predetermined election, God has a certain number of people that are going to be saved and lost, I can't find that in the Bible. So what that tells me is the Primitive Baptist Church is not really in the Bible. And therefore, it is not what's produced when you plant the seed, which is the Word of God. You're on the Word from the Lord. Uh, yes. Uh, you know they ain't going to change because it'll dip into the, their control and their money. Well, it, 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 you, what, you mean, what do you mean they ch wouldn't change? What do you mean? I mean they, they, they don't want to change to the Church of Christ because uh, it's going to dip into, if they go by the Church of Christ, what the Bible says, it's... Uh, it's going, to, it's going to dip into their control of the, what they're in and the money that they get. Okay, but you know what? I, I, think, I think that's probably true, but I think there's a bigger reason for that. And I think it's because if they do, if they, if they change, then guess what they've just admitted? They've admitted that they've been wrong all this time. They've been calling themselves something oh, that yeah. someone else called them, or they're going to have to admit that, hey, we've been wrong on something. And you know what, friends? If you've been wrong about what you've been called, can you really say that you're the church that you read about in the Bible? Can you really say that you found the church, that you're identical to the church you read about in the Bible, when you then have to admit that, you know what, I've been calling ourselves by the wrong name all this time? So, yeah, I see what you're yeah, saying there. But yeah, I, you know, and I think their pride is, is too, too strong for that. You know, the, to, to say that they're wrong, to say that they've been following... I mean, can you believe that the guy says, well, the, primitive, it, the churches of Christ were called primitive Baptists by the other denominations. Well, why don't you just drop primitive Baptist then? That'd be easy, wouldn't it? Yeah. Which won't do it. I, uh, I uh, was wrong for 46 years going to all these different other things until 2007 when I obeyed the gospel. Okay. Well, it's, it, it's, tough, to, it's tough to admit you're wrong, but... It sure is. It sure is a relief when you know that, that what you did was right. Off me. It took That's away right. all my heart and mind. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Well, okay. Well, Thank I'm you very much. I'm glad you. I'm glad you. Uh, uh, I'm glad you uh, uh, swallowed your pride and humbled yourself in obedience to God. Yeah, I did. I had to. It was killing my conscience. Okay. When I finally seen what I was reading in the Bible was different from the preachers preaching at the churches I was going to. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate okay, you. I appreciate you. Good night. Call. All right, friends. So now, so, so Mr. Richardson, he doesn't, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't like it when we say that the church that we're in is the only true church. That's religiously superior. He does the same thing. He turned around and did the same thing, and so does Mr. Hopkins in the Primitive Baptist Church. But here's the thing, friends: the Primitive Baptist Church and the Apostolic Church, they both can't be right. They both can't be right. And you know what? When you search the Bible, when you search the seed that produces the New Testament church, you know what you'll find? It's never called the apostolic church. It's never called the primitive Baptist church. So I know right there that they were produced from another seed. They were produced from, they come from another plant. See that? So, so religiously superior. J.C. Richardson, religiously superior in his thinking. But when the, word is, when the word of the kingdom is sown and it falls on good and honest hearts, friends, here's, here's the power. Then it, it will germinate and will produce. Luke 8, verse 15. You're on the word from the Lord. Uh, yeah, just a quick comment uh, or question, maybe. Okay. Uh, Primitive Baptist and Church of Christ. Uh, what is the difference between the two on what they say about born into sin? Well, the primitive I mean, uh, the primitive Baptists will teach that, that a person is born in sin. They, they, they inherit a sinful nature from Adam. And the Bible teaches, the Bible teaches that a child is born innocent. Okay. So, according to so the the, the if you follow the primitive Baptist doctrine. If a child dies in infancy and they're born sinners, are sinners going to be in heaven? I'll see what you're saying. See what I'm saying? So 
you know, it just, there's, and it's just a whole lot of, uh, so then what they have to do, you know, they don't want to say that a child's going to be in hell. I mean, right. who, who wants to hear that? So then they have to come up with another, they have to come up with another doctrine that says, well, God's grace is going to cover that. See that? And so it's just a, a, a big problem if they say that a child inherits Adam's sin, but then Christ came to rid the world of sin. Right. So now what if, so if you've got two people that are born in sin, a man and a woman are born in sin, they, they mature and they marry, and now they have a child. The Baptist would teach that that child's born in sin. But if those two people, if those two people obey the gospel and they become children of God and they've been washed from their sins by the blood of Christ, what should be the logical conclusion about their child? Okay. What, what, I see what you're saying. What, what would, what, what, just say it for me, what would happen to their child if they were, if they'd been washed in the blood and their sin's gone? Then their offspring would somewhat inherit from from the parents being washed in the blood. Yeah. It, they sh- it, the child should inherit righteousness, right? Right. Yeah. But yeah. but see, that's well, no, you know, they still get they still get Adam's sin. So what the ba- the primitive Baptist is actually saying is that the curse is stronger than the cure. Christ came right. to to wash the world to, to get rid the world of sin, but primitive Baptist says, well, it just wasn't enough, wasn't strong enough, you know. Well, I just, you know, that's so not what, what the Bible do, teaches. So what do they say would happen to that child? Well, th- they'll, they'll say that, that, you know, God's grace is going to save them. I don't know exactly how they would say it, but they wouldn't condemn that child to hell. But at the same time, they would turn around and say that God has only selected a certain number of people to be saved, and that number won't change. They believe in a predetermined elect number. So, for all they know, that child that died was going to hell. Yeah. So, that's what I'm saying. When you start, when you start uh, teaching a false doctrine, then, then you have to make up another doctrine to cover that doctrine. It's just like a lie, really. You know, what's the saying about a lie? When you tell a lie, you tell another one to cover it. Right. Well, that's the same way with false doctrine. You know, it's a lie, so you have to tell another lie to cover it. So, but that's how, that's how I know that the Primitive Baptist Church is not identical to the church that you read about in the Bible. Right. So, okay. that help? All right. Well, I'll let you go on. You might have another call. Though. All right. I just want to ask you and see what All right. I appreciate your call. Good call. Thanks. All right. There you go, friends. It's just, you know, a little reasoning together. It goes a long way. Now, so the seed, the seed is, the, is of the kingdom is the word, and... When it is planted, guess what? It produces Christians who become members of the church of Christ. It's just that simple. Now, I want to get this in before, before we go uh, off the air. And I'm running close to time. I'm like, I think I'm about what? About six minutes? Uh, so, so here we go. In Luke 18, verse 15, the seed that's planted in the honest good heart brings forth fruit. Now, friends, in the first century, in, in Acts chapter 2, The seed of the word was sown into the hearts of men, and the church of Christ was produced. The Bible says in Acts 2, in verse 38, they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter tells them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now watch this. They were going to... How are they going to get rid of their sins? Repent and be baptized for the mission of sins. Now, notice in verse 40, in verse 40, many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from his untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added to them about 3,000 souls. Well, what, to what were they added? Where were the saved that had obeyed the gospel? Where were they placed? Acts 2, verse 47. The Bible says, praising God and having faith with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. They were placed in the church. Now, what church was that? It wasn't the Primitive Baptist Church. It wasn't the Apostolic Church. 
It was the church that Christ built. Now, Mr. Richardson said it right, the church of Jesus. Now, why does he then turn around and call it the apostolic church? See that? On one hand, he's calling it the church of Jesus, and then he says the apostolic church. No, Mr. Richardson, you, you got it wrong. can't be the same. It's not the apostolic church that you read about in the Bible. It's the church of Christ. The church of Christ. Now, friends, let me show you this. Here's another quote from Mr. Uh, Richardson. Here's another quote from Mr. Richardson. And he says, uh, let me get over here. He says, we learned that one who rose to leadership in this movement, talking about the Church of Christ, was Thomas Campbell, who started what we now know is the Church of Christ. Now, Mr. Hopkins said it was started by Alexander Campbell, which is Thomas's son. Well, which was it? Was it Alexander or was it Thomas? See, even the naysayers, the critics, they can't even get their facts right on who started the so-called Church of Christ in the 18th century, 18th, yeah, 18th century. Alexander Campbell, it was Alexander Campbell who really set in motion the foundation for the group that is now known as the Church of Christ. So Thomas Campbell, according to J.C. Richardson, is what, what, where the church started, and Alexander Campbell just got the ball rolling. Mr. Hopkins says the same thing. Started in the 18th century, no proof of the Church of Christ in the Bible before then, yada, yada, yada. Friends, notice this. Notice this. There were members of the church in the United States before 1820. Now that's when, that's when Mr. Uh, Richardson said the church really got started. But I want you to notice this. This is a, uh, a tombstone, and I know it's very difficult to read, but this is a tombstone of a man named William Rogers, and it's in Bethany, West Virginia, and this is what it says. It says that William Rogers was, uh, was born in 1784 and removed with his father to Cane Ridge and that he joined himself with the Church of Christ in 1807. And he died in uh, 1852, I believe is, is the date on that. But he became a member of the Lord's Church in 1807. 1807. Now, Mr. Richardson, he hadn't done his research. He said the church started in the 1820s. Got rolled in the 1820s. But notice this. Notice this. All right, just one, one second here. Here's a sign that says the Church of Christ in 1710. Meeting house of the Church of Christ in, in uh, Rumney Marsh, erected in 1710. Thomas Cheever, the first settled minister, died December 24th, 1749, aged 91 years old. Friends, Thomas Campbell, who everybody says started the Church of Christ, wasn't born until 1763. So here's the Church of Christ that Thomas Campbell supposedly started that was in existence some 20 years before he was even born. Now, friends, even Jesus had to raise from the dead before he started his church. These folks got, the, got Thomas Campbell starting a church 20 years before he's even born. Boy, that's powerful. Friends, let's just go back to the Bible and realize the church always existed in the seed, which is the Word of God, and this is the church you can find today, meaning at 250 the Boulevard, 823 Starling Avenue, and 120 American Legion. Same church. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. Always ask for a word from the Lord. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership.
And hi, everybody. Welcome to Star News right now. Welcome to the Thursday edition, the eighth day of August 2013. Where in the world has the month gone so far? It seems to be moving rather quickly. Before you know it, Labor Day will be here, but let's not get ahead of ourselves exactly uh, right yet anyway, right? Uh, 84 degrees, that's what we have at our studios in downtown Reedsville, North Carolina, under mostly clear skies at this point. It's been cloudy in the earlier part of the day, but things uh, definitely improving over the last little bit. We've got to look at the forecast coming up in just a moment with Matt Smith, and fingers crossed the weekend is going to look a lot better than the last few days. But right now, let's go ahead and take a look at what's happening across the area. And I'll tell you more about uh, what's coming up in this hour on Star News. The Rockingham County Fire Marshal's Office has an investigation underway. That was after an early morning fire at a house on the northern side of the city. And according to the Fire Marshal's Office, the fire was intentionally set and they do have a possible suspect description. Now, according to Rockingham County Assistant Fire Marshal Jay Brooks, it was at 2.48 this morning that the Rockingham County 911 Center received a call from ADT Security reporting that a burglar alarm had been activated at 180 North Willow Street that's on the north side of Reedsville. Deputies from the Rockingham County Sheriff's Office, they were dispatched to that location. And once they arrived on the scene, they found smoke coming from the house. Now, the county's 911 center dispatched the Yanceyville Road Fire Department, and they received mutual aid assistance from the Oregon Hill Fire Department and the Williamsburg Fire Department. Now, according to Assistant Fire Marshal Brooks, the fire was quickly brought under control, although the house sustained moderate fire damage to the interior. Personnel from the Rockingham County Fire Marshal's Office responded to the scene of the blaze, along with the fire-trained canine by the name of Phoenix. Now, the dog made several alerts on the interior portion of the home, and that's where samples were taken for analysis. According to Brooks, those samples will be submitted to the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation Laboratory. On the exterior of the home on Willow Street, obscenities had been spray painted across the rear wall. Brooks added that from the evidence gathered at the scene, it has been determined that the fire was intentionally set. A possible suspect has been identified as a young